All right, good afternoon. We're glad to see this number back this afternoon for our afternoon discussion class. Open your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 15. That's where we're going to be discussing a text of Scripture together. I am hereby opening this up for discussion. And so we welcome your comments and your thoughts as we pursue this uh, in the way of a class together. Just by glancing over it as you've opened it, or for some of you from memory, simply having studied it through the years and being familiar with it, when Luke chapter 15 comes up, what comes to mind? What do we know immediately about this entire chapter? I'm sorry? Parable of the prodigal son? The lost sheep. Parable of the lost sheep. What else was said? Parable of the prodigal son. <laughs> prodigal son. Okay, something over here. The lost coin. Okay, so y'all just covered the lost thing. So why don't we call this, if you're making notes, let's make this discussion class the chapter of lost things. Okay, the chapter of lost things. We have the lost sheep. We have the lost coin. And we also have the lost son. And if you want to alliterate, you can do sheep, silver, because I'm told these coins were typically silver coins. So lost sheep, lost silver, lost son. Okay? Anything else about Luke 15 that sticks out in your minds before we uh, move on with another train of thought? They were recovered. Three things were recovered. You know, Pete, uh, we wish that in life it was always that way, don't we? That there were three lost things, the lost sheep, the lost silver, and the lost son, but in these parables all three were recovered. So that that is a, a good thing. Now, I, I will throw a little wrench into that on the tail end. At the end of the chapter, there's one person whose destiny is up in the air. Who is it? Okay, the older brother. That's right, the older brother in the parable of the lost son, the prodigal, uh, we don't know about him. And there's a reason. There's a reason why that parable's left like that in this context. And we're going to explore that, Lord willing, uh, during our time together. Anything else before we look at verse 1? Hmm. Very good, Erica. Erica pointed out that they grow in their value as you go through these. You know, you lost one sheep out of a hundred. That doesn't sound so bad. You lose one of these silver coins out of ten. That sounds worse, and it was really bad because this was a wedding gift, basically, and there were supposed to be ten coins, and so when one was missing, that was a very conspicuous loss, and so that is bad. And then one out of two sons which uh, we're going to see, it seems maybe at one point he might have had both sons lost, you know, and then one comes back home and uh, maybe still the other one is yet lost. And so, uh, good point. Increasing uh, ratios, if you will, as we move through the chapter. Anything else? This is so good that we might just keep doing this. Forgiveness? Forgiveness? Yeah. That, that's a big part of it, Patrick, because that, that's going to be my segue right there. That comment Patrick brought up on forgiveness. Because look at the first two verses of the chapter. That's how we can get into the text. Then drew near unto him, unto Jesus, all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And so when it comes to forgiving others, or to state it a little differently, when it comes to seeing that others are forgiven, forgiven ultimately by God, which is most important, here we see that the Pharisees and the scribes do not have the same interest in that that Jesus had. True or false? That's true. That's true. Um, they, they did not have the same interest in that. Now, Building on that from verse 1, why do you think these publicans and sinners, by the way, publicans were outcasts. 
We're, we're dealing with all Jewish people. Okay, the publicans were Jews, but why were they societal outcasts? For for what regime? The Romans. So they were viewed as the, the worst kind of traitors, you might say. Here you are, you're a Jew, and you're coming around and you're taking my Jewish money and you're going to give my Jewish money to this heathen Roman government. And so they were viewed as traitors, they were societal outcasts, and then your sinners... Okay. the better they did. Yeah, and now as I understand it, Rick, and I'm no expert on the publicans at all, but as I understand it, I think the way the Roman system might have been set up, I think they were expected to, to get paid themselves, but whenever that is unpoliced like that, then the corruption ensues, you know, because you go from making a living to making a killing, and, and you do it at the expense of others. Uh, that's my understanding on that. But that's a good point. They were notorious for their corruption. And so not only would they have been viewed as traitors, they would have been viewed as cheats and lies and, and corrupt corrupt people. So that's also a good point. Uh, well, I didn't say that. And then uh, sinners. You got your publicans and your sinners. Uh, if you included females, your sinners would almost always have been what type of woman? harlots and prostitutes that they would have been classed among this this group your men would have been known as wine bibbers they would have been drunks they would have been crooks and cheats uh sinners okay and so you you've got people here that are rejected by society you've got people who definitely have their spiritual problems and so let me ask you this why are these type people drawing near to jesus Need and because they felt welcomed. There, there's got to be some kind. Of, why are they not drawing near to the Pharisees and the scribes? Okay, okay. The parable. They were. Luke 18. How did the Pharisee talk about the publican at the temple? Lord, thank you that you didn't make me as other men are, say, this publican down here. I'm so glad I'm not like him. So if that's your prevailing attitude, then they're not going to be drawn to you. They're not going to be attracted to you. And with Jesus and his ministry and his love and compassion, would that have been a breath of fresh air? That would have been a breath of fresh air. And so that, that's what gets us into this chapter. Remember this. I don't know if it was Lockyer who coined it or who coined it, but the key to a parable often hangs where? On its front door. Okay? The key to a parable often hangs on its front door. That's why verses 1 and 2 are critical. Now we know, we know what's leading up, not to just one parable, we know what's leading up to all three of these parables. Yes, Brother Camp? And he was willing to do it, right? Yes. All right, very good. Brother Camp mentioned Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a, a chief publican. He was a chief tax collector, and yet he was uh, willing to even climb a tree just to be able to see Jesus. I think we learn a lot about Zacchaeus in uh, Luke 19. We learn that he might have been a notable exception among some of the tax collectors of that day and time. All right, so verses 1 and 2 get us into this parable and the two that follow. So let, let's look at the first parable, the parable of the lost sheep. He spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and the nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost, until he find it. And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you, now this is when Jesus drives home the point of the parable, 
I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Why would Jesus emphasize, I say unto you that when a sinner comes home, this is what goes on in heaven. Why would Jesus say that? What's the implication of that here on earth? That's it, Erica. If, if when, when a sinner comes home, there's joy in heaven, the implication is, is when a sinner comes home, what should happen here? You know, if it's good enough for a celebration in heaven, then we ought to be celebrating, we ought to be thankful and rejoicing here on earth. Absolutely. That's the point there. All right, let's go into the second parable. Either what woman, having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle, and sweep the house, and seek diligently till she find it? And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Now, we understand that point, verse 10, about the joy in heaven. There should be joy on earth. Look at something else Jesus has done. And, and by the way, the way Luke records this is as soon as the murmuring of the Pharisees and scribes give way or gives rise to this parable, Jesus gives them in quick succession. Okay? He, he gives the parable of the lost shepherd or lost sheep, parable of the lost silver and the lost son. He gives them in quick succession. What happens between the first two? Who, who are the first two parables going to appeal to? Males and females in the first parable. Jesus does this in a way, typically your shepherds back then, all of your shepherds would have been men. Okay, Your shepherds would have been males. And so the parable of the lost sheep, the males could have readily related to that. But then this second parable, the parable of the lost coin, this was purely a female thing. This was something that men would not have related to as readily, but the women, if any women were present, they would have related to this. Because apparently this was some kind of a necklace that was connected to their wedding day. The woman would have kept this throughout her married life. It, it typically had ten silver coins on it. And anytime she picked it up, anytime she looked at it, it would have reminded her of her wedding day. So it, it would have been a devastating loss to pick it up one day and notice that right here's a gap. You know, I've got coins nine to eight, nine, and ten, and I've got coins one through six, but I'm missing coin seven. That, that would have been a terrible thing. And so in these first two parables, Jesus has related to both male and and female. Do you think he wants people to understand about lost subjects? I think so. No doubt about it. All right, verse 11. Let's uh, read through quickly on the parable of the prodigal son. And he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them, apparently unto them both, his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks, that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. 
But he arose and he came to his father, and he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him. Now let me pause here. How does the father see the son when he is yet a great ways off? How is that possible? Someone said it. He's looking for him. That's exactly right. Okay. Uh, I was told a long time ago that you don't find ironiton on accident. Okay. Now take that for what you will. But uh, I think somebody after they had missed our lectureship, maybe two years in a row, I'm not sure, said you don't find Ironiton on accident. Okay. So in other words, if you find us here at Ironiton, you're probably looking for us. Uh, the father in the parable if the son is still a great ways off, he's looking for him. That's the only reason he sees him. Is because, do you think every day, every evening at the close of day, what do you think the father had been waiting on? I want my son to come home. I, I want my son to come home. Day in, day out. Heartbreak. Uh, you know, just heartbreak is the best word. But he's looking, and now his father sees him. Verse 20, continuing, He had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. In this ancient time, guess who did not wear shoes? Slaves. Slaves did not wear shoes. What kind of life had this boy been reduced to in the foreign country? Life of a slave. You, like, you might think, well, he was a slave to the foreign landowner or to the foreign swine farmer. No, he was really a slave to himself. He had really been a slave to his own selfishness, his own greed and inconsideration. He'd been a slave to himself. And so his spiritual slavery is really well pictured in his physical condition. He says, put shoes on his feet, verse 23, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Two great statements there. And they began to be merry. Now, verse 25 is the moving point, this changing point, transition point in the parable. Now, his elder son was in the field. And as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things mean or meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf because he hath received him safe and sound. Underline that, safe and sound. You didn't know that was a biblical term, did you? It's kind of like high time. Did you know that came from the Bible? It's high time we did this or that. That's Romans 13. Safe and sound. That's Luke 15. That came from the Bible. If the father saw the son because he was looking for him, pray tell me, why did the family just happen to have a fatted calf ready? Just in case he came home, very plausible, very plausible. I want my son to come home, and I tell you what, when my son comes home, I'm going to be ready. We're going to have this fatted calf, and when he comes home, we're going to celebrate. Possibly. All right, verse 28. And he, the elder brother, he was angry. And would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. Neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never, you never gave me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. He says, you never let me uh, cut loose and have a party and a celebration like this. But as soon as this thy son was come. What do you hear in that, ter that terminology right there? Yeah. He didn't say my brother, did he? 
He's not even claiming him as my brother. He said, as soon as this, your son, comes home, okay, which I think he's, I don't think he's done, is he? Uh, which hath devoured thy living with harlots. Do we know that? No, no. But in psychology, if you project, what does that mean? That's what I would have done. You know, I got my inheritance at the same time he got his because probably of necessity, when the father liquidated his assets and divided it, he just went ahead and did both at the same time. He says, I got my inheritance at the same time he got his, but I stayed. I stayed here with you. But in all likelihood, if I could have gone, this is what I would have done. I would have lived it up with harlots and whatever else. And so that's, that's a little bit of a psychological betrayal there probably in that statement. Thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. Okay, in the father's eyes, this was the loyalty that he had to his older son. His older son had stayed. Father knew that. The father respected that. You've stayed. All that I have is yours. It was meet, it was fitting that we should make merry and be glad for this thy brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Now, uh, you've heard me say before, it's been a long time, so I'll say it again. If the Holy Spirit tells us anything once, it's what? It's important. So what if the Holy Spirit tells us something twice in the same context? It's important, important, okay? It's odd here that this is repeated the same terminology in verse 24 is repeated in verse 32. The emphasis being he was dead, but he's alive again. He was lost, but now he's found. Very apt descriptions of what it means every time a soul is saved. Okay, very apt descriptions. Now, I pulled the board up here. Because look at these three parables. We read this. We took the time to read this entire chapter. Tell me everything that is common in all three parables. As you survey parable one, two, and three, what are some elements that we know are common? I'll get you started. Each one has something lost. Very good. All right. What else is something that is common to all three parables? Okay, as Pete said earlier, the, uh, the lost things or lost thing is recovered. Okay, with one possible exception with the older brother. But see, we didn't know he was lost. We didn't know it, but apparently he, I think the evidence suggests he was lost the entire time. He was just lost at home. And we'll talk about that in a minute. All right, number three. What's something else that is common to all three parables? Okay. Okay, so let's see here. I'm, I'm going to put in quotes, faith. I don't know if that's the best word, but... Well, yeah, so that, that's the same thing. I'm going to put faith slash expectation... Slash, in some cases, effort so that the lost thing would be found. Okay? But we'll get it in there one way or another with that. All right, what else is common to all three parables? That's, that's what I was waiting on. Number four, in all three parables, when the lost item was found, there was great rejoicing. Okay? Great rejoicing. And it's interesting Jesus doesn't have to do this in the third parable. But in the first parable, the shepherd tells his friends, I want you to rejoice with me. I found my lost sheep. Jesus says, oh, by the way, there's rejoicing in heaven. Second parable, the woman says to her friends, I want you to rejoice with me. I found my lost coin. Jesus says, oh, by the way, there's rejoicing in heaven. In the third parable, the father throws this celebration, this party, uh, rejoicing over the return of his son, Jesus does not have to emphasize, oh, by the way, there's rejoicing in heaven. He, he doesn't have to do that a third time. 
uh, in part perhaps because the fate, fate's not a good word, the destiny of the older son still hangs in the balance. Okay? Because of his attitude. And so that, that's an interesting difference. But even at that, they're still rejoicing in all three parables. All right, what else? Is there anything else that you can pick out that is common to all three parables? I believe that's the big items. All right. So now let's do this. Let's build. We've got all these. But let's focus on the lost things, number one. Look at this first parable. Let's go to the parable of the lost sheep. How does a sheep become lost? How does that happen? Lost sheep. Strays. Leaves the flock. I'm going to put flock in parentheses here. Okay, How does that happen? It, I don't know if any of us ever raised sheep. Probably not in this part of the country much. But How, how does that happen with some uh, grazing animals? How does that happen? Follow the grass. You get your head down. You get your head down and you're eating. Gwen says you follow the grass, which I like that. And you're eating, and you're picking, and you're eating, and you're picking, and you're eating, and you're just as happy as you can be. And all of a sudden, you look up, and you're chewing your cud, whatever. And where's everybody at? They go the other way. <laughs> you don't know which way they are. All right. So here, when you're thinking about a sheep, what this puts us in mind as is there's a carelessness about this. Okay, dumb animals. So, so that contributes to this problem, doesn't it? Okay. Here, I'm going to put that. Since I now have authority to put dumb on the board, since you used that word. So I'm going I'm to put it in all caps, dumb. Because let me just tell you, as a gospel preacher, I can't tell you how many times over the last 30 years I've looked at people's actions and in, inside I said, man, that's just dumb. I'm sorry, but you choose sin over Jesus, that's dumb 100% of the time. And so, yes, sheep are dumb animals. Now, I get to write that on the board for one time, Geraldine. That's right. Let's see how I want to uh, flesh this out a little bit. This man had a hundred sheep. In the flock, the flock of the 90 and 9, there was safety. True or false? That's true. But when you put your head down, and you act dumb, and you stray and you get careless and you're focused on something else, when you get away from the flock, you're no longer in safety. You've left a place of safety. What about when people leave the Lord's church? It's not smart, okay? <laughs> it's the same thing as that sheep. We leave the confines, we leave the fellowship, we leave the safety of God's people, and we get out. By the way, if you leave the church, what's the alternative? You're either in the church or you're in the what? The world. Okay? Not safe. Not safe in the world. The, the sheep left that. No, that's, exact, that's a great point. That's a great point. If you didn't hear Erica, staying in the church does not ensure that you won't be attacked. It just improves your chance of survival. That's a great point. I read a thing years ago. It said some of the people who have hurt me the most deeply were members of the church. And then the article went on to say, but some of the people who have blessed my life the most richly we're also members of the church. Huh? I like that. The closer you are to the center of the flock, the better off you are. What does that say or suggest, Andy, about so-called fringe members of the church? They're just one step away. They're, they're in a, diff, a difficult, difficult, dangerous position. 
being being on the fringe. When it Mm-hmm. Yes. That's a wonderful thing. And we're going to talk more about that if we don't let time get away from us. I, let me circle or underline this word right here, carelessness. Okay? In this first parable, somebody becomes lost due to whose carelessness? Their own. All right, let's move down now and let's talk about silver. Let's talk about the lost silver. How does this piece become lost? Oh, hmm. Carelessness of others. I got to be careful when I explain this, okay? Because I, I don't want you to misunderstand. There, there's still a sense if you give up on the Lord, you quit the church, you walk away, whatever, there's still a real big sense in which that's on you, okay? That's you. That's between you and God. And when you stand before God, you'll be condemned for your own choice. So all that's still true. It's also true, what, Jim? Okay. <laughs> and I, I mean, I guess I was careless and we're elated, but I thought I knew for sure we're elated, and it took me 30 minutes to find it. So yeah. I just, I mean, it just struck me when, you know, the immediate response there was she was careless. Yeah. But, but was she careless? But she, I mean, the point there is, I guess, you, you could even, it, you could be careless, or even if you're not careless, just in the course of every, you know, your everyday life, you still have things Okay, I, I think that's a fair point. I, I would say this, building on what you said, when we lose things, even if it's inadvertently, there's still a degree of carelessness on it. There is. Um, and, and different things, <laughs> different things come into play. Um, you said something else that, that made uh, really good sense toward the end. Oh, I've lost it again. Uh, we'll come back to that in a minute. Maybe, if I can think of it. But yeah, let, let's use this for the, uh, I think there's still a degree of carelessness. This is supposedly one of the wives' most prized possessions, which would, would mean they would be even expected more care for this. Uh, but this is what I was building on a while ago. When somebody leaves the church and walks away, that's on them. But God forbid if I contributed to that through something I said or something I did, okay? I, I, if you know me well, you know Cliff Goodwin is not in the business of making excuses for sinners and delinquents. I don't like that. Okay? And when I go visit them and they tell me everything and the reason why they can't come to church, that doesn't hold a bit of water with me, okay? But on the flip side, on the flip side of that, Jesus did say, Woe unto them through whom offenses or occasions of stumbling what? Come. Don't be the instrument. Don't be the careless person who with your words or your actions or your attitude, don't be the one who helped open the door for that person to leave. That's still on them. That's still on them. There's no excuse. But now it's on them and it's on 
you're culpable. Now you have a part in it. And so that's interesting to me in this. This is an inanimate object. In the parable, a silver coin is an inanimate object. Okay? So that would highlight that it's become lost in part to the actions of another. And so that, that's interesting to me. Number three, what about the sun right here? We, we've seen carelessness these first two times. There's a different word when it comes to the lost son. It's not necessarily carelessness. It's what? What got the boy to leave home? Okay, but covetousness, well, he could have stayed home and been greedy. He could have stayed home and been greedy. What got the boy to leave home? Selfishness. Willfulness is really the word I want, but I'm going to put both of them up here. Selfishness, willfulness. See, that old, that old dumb, wandering sheep, Andy tells us about the dumb sheep, it's not necessarily, you know, she's not deliberately wanting to leave the flock. She just, she's just eating. She's just picking. She's careless. This, this coin, this coin's an inanimate object. Maybe you have the carelessness of the, of the wife. But the son right here now, he's bent that he could have it better away from daddy. I need to be away from daddy. Okay. Now you're getting to where I'm wrapping it up. We'll go ahead and wrap this up. In these three pictures right here, the sheep represents people who are lost and they know they're lost, but they don't know what? They don't know the way back. Write that down if you're making notes. The sheep represents people who are lost and once they look up, they they like, oh, I'm lost. They know they're lost, but being a dumb sheep, they don't know the way back. The world's got some of those people in it, okay? Number two, the coin, the lost silver, represents people who are lost. They're just as lost as this sheep. But you know what? As Andy said, what? They have no idea. That, this to me is scary. But both these last two are especially scary. They are just as lost as the sheep, but they do not have a foggy notion that they're lost. Okay? That, that comes to mind in representation of the silver coin. And then number three, the son, he's lost. He knows he's lost. And what else does he know that the sheep doesn't know? He knows the way back. Okay, see, see how this builds and how they all kind of interconnect? The this, this son, he's lost. He knows he's lost and he knows the way back. What got him into trouble to begin with? His what? His will. So if he knows he's lost and he knows the way back, what's it going to take for him to become regained? A changing of the what? He's got to operate that will. He already knows he's lost. And unlike the sheep, he already knows the way to get unlost. His problem is a problem of the will. And he's got to activate that. Okay, Brad? Well, let's, let's build on that last thought, Brad. In this case, the father did not go looking. For people who know and they know the way back, they've got to make their own decision. They've got their will. These two, this shows us that there are people we've got to go out looking for. 
And some people, the moment they we find them and they see the truth, they're going to be what? They're going to be glad to see us. Do you think that lost sheep was glad to see the shepherd? So there's some people that are lost and they know they're lost. They just don't know the way to be saved. And, and those that's the low-hanging fruit. The moment they meet you and me, the moment they see the truth, they're glad to see it. This is These two are the hardest groups right here. These people we also go looking for, just like in the parable. The woman, she swept her house. She's looking for this. The problem with, with these people are is that when we find them, they're not always happy to be found. Because what do they not know? They don't know they're lost. We run into this a lot, don't we? Run into that a lot. And so there, there's a lot of spiritual lessons in that, uh, in this whole chapter. This is an amazing chapter, as you well know. A lot of spiritual lessons. Seems like there was one other thing. Our time's about up. There was, seems like there was something else. Oh, okay. So if, if all of these wind up being recovered, the sheep, the silver, and the, the youngest son, who does the older brother represent in the parable? Pharisees and the scribes, immediately in the context. Why is that hanging up in the act? By the way, when the parable closes, we don't know what when the parable closes. We don't know. See, we assume that he never went in the party. That's what we assume. But the father made another plea. See, the father made another plea. He said, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should do this. This is suitable. This is fitting. And then the parable just abruptly ends. Jesus doesn't say the, the older boy stayed outside. He doesn't say it just ends. Well, in much the same way, when Pentecost came, how many people obeyed the gospel? About 3,000. Do you think any of them might have been scribes and Pharisees? Might have been. What about Nicodemus? Nicodemus was a Pharisee. Okay, Joseph of Arimathea, I think, was a, I know he was a rich man. I think he was a Pharisee. Okay, So this is left hanging because it depends on every individual. The, the scribes and the Pharisees, how are we going to react? Are we glad to see others being saved and now I know I need to be saved? Am I going to react to this favorably or am I going to be like the older brother starts out and I'm going to remain obstinate and say, no, I'm not coming in. I'm not doing this. We don't know because that's up to the individual. Let me give you another secondary application of the older brother. Now, I wouldn't force this, but I think it's just something to think about. Against the backdrop of Jewish culture, which the Pharisees and the scribes were at the forefront of Jewish culture, there's a possibility, a secondary possibility in the parable that the older brother can represent the Jews as a whole and the younger brother might represent the Gentiles. Because once the church is fully established, the Gentiles eventually are going to come in and does that prove to be a problem for some of the Jews? It does. It proves to be a problem. And so there's a little bit of a connection there. I wouldn't force that, but I think it's worth noting. All right, let's close our Bibles and let's take our song books out. Still my favorite, my favorite class of the week, I think, still Sunday afternoon. I appreciate the good comments, all your uh, thoughts and everything. Before we leave and go our separate ways, friend, if you're here and you need to obey the gospel, uh, the Bible says to believe on Jesus Christ, John 8, 24. You've got to believe in, in Him as Lord and Savior, he, His death, His burial, and His resurrection, the Son of God. Repent, turn from sins, Luke 13, 3. You have to make a decision, just like the prodigal son in the parable, he made a decision to turn and to come home. Confess Jesus even with your mouth. Confession is made unto salvation, Romans 10, 9 and 10. And put Jesus on in baptism, Galatians 3, 27, for the purpose of washing away your sins, Acts 22, 16. The Lord will add you to his church, Acts 2, 47. That is the church of Christ, Romans 16, 16. And you'll be in a safe condition. And that's what... God wants, there will be rejoicing in heaven. By the way, this is the one thing I meant to bring out and I did not bring it out. In verse 10, the Bible says that there will be rejoicing 
before the angels. For years, I read 7 and 10, and I thought the angels were rejoicing. They might have been. They probably were. But the Bible says that there's rejoicing before or in the presence of the angels. Who's in the presence of the angels? God. God. And so there will be rejoicing in heaven itself if you obey the gospel. Brother or sister, if, if you're the prodigal in a sense, if you're away for whatever reason, whatever sin, please come home. Come home and repent. We'll pray with you and for you. And the Bible says God will forgive you. God loves you and we do too. Please come as we stand and as we sing.